Well, thank you very much for being here. And I have Graham Hall here with me from Insight Edge. And we're working at Clark Shoes. And what we're doing is bringing precision to research. And that's what this is about. And it's all about coming into this research and social data with a focus like a focus group would have, actually having that kind of approach, OK, and getting that deep. So I'll just make a short introduction about our work together. And then I'm going to really kind of grill Graham here for a little while. <clears throat> and then he's probably going to grill me. So uh, at Clark Shoes, I had an opportunity to use social media intelligence. And one of the things that was challenging was delivering an idea that really kind of grabbed, uh, you know, had purchase, as it were. And so Graham came in to work with me on how can we take the social data and how can we bring something out of it that has real insight, you know, something that a focus group would give us. Uh, and so you see here on the screen, Graham is there. Graham, what do you do for a living? Well, I am classically a, a market research consultant. I've had my agencies all around, worked all around the world doing focus groups mostly. I'm delivering insights to for all kinds of clients over the last 25 years. And um, a lot of it is trying to get into a understanding the motivations of a small number of people you know you know what a focus groups like there's eight people there or and you can spend two hours talking to them about what why they buy a pair of shoes or buy a pair of uh, trainers or you know piece of software we helped launch P uh, PlayStation etc so it's all kind of understanding the motivations behind why people do things it's very different discipline from quant even although quantitative research is you know, you're looking at large numbers of people looking for patterns within the data. Qualitative, you're looking for uh, much smaller data sets, but in more, much deeper depth. So it's, it's diametrically opposed, perhaps, to what you were doing, Nate, at Clark's. I mean, I want to say Clark, uh, Nate was doing a great job at, at Clark's understanding and monitoring all of the, the, the social media that was going on and pulling out insights. But uh, the guys at Clark's thought, maybe there, there, must be some, there must be more depth here as well. There was a sort of in, intuition that there may be more to, p to pull out of that information, that data. And that's why I was brought in it as an experiment, I think, to see what was there. And we had a, we've had a, a cool couple of months kicking around concepts, the way you work, the way I work. And this kind of meeting of these two approaches, I think, has been very valuable. So as you saw on the slide before, <clears throat> Uh, we just were able to discover through Brandwatch, obviously, people that were talking about topics, but Graham wanted to see a lot more. And so we were able to get into a point where we actually saw what those people who were talking about a specific topic, like Clark Shoes, everything else they were talking about. And that was sort of our victory in this project. And that's what we want to discuss here with you today, okay? Uh, you know, when we got into that kind of a change, it was profound, right? With audience monitoring, you get to see a lot more about the people that talk about your brand. And that's what's exciting uh, in this type of work right now with Brandwatch for us, is being able to understand more about the people, getting deeper into what they're actually talking about. Do you want to talk about that a bit? I want to talk about uh, coming in the first week to see you and you yeah. showing me what the hell you were doing. And you, know, you had this very impressive array of screens. Uh, which were available, and uh, so all the guys at Clark's could see people tweeting about the brand. You know, you've seen that kind of, the Vizier kind of approach to uh, really representing what's going on out there in the in the in the blog and Twitter sphere, etc. And uh, and that that was cool. But then I was saying, so after about a week of understanding how you were doing that, to then ask questions like, so, but what if we, you know, what if we took that information and and found out what those people were talking about. And then we would grapple about, well, how do we do that? And we came up with a load of different iterations. This was very much evolving our thinking as we went along. Like, for example, we did a query <clears throat> on shoes, jumpers, jeans, dresses. We call it the shoes, jumpers, and jeans query. And we uploaded a bunch of authors, like mums in the UK that had mentioned Clark's, or you know, people that were complaining about something in the store, or lots of other things. And we were comparing what they were talking about, about shoes, about jumpers, about jeans, about dresses, as a way of sort of taking a larger query 
and getting some bigger information about those people. But we still wanted to know more about it. We still wanted to know everything those people were talking about. I think there came a point when we were looking at people who, love, who were saying, we love clocks. And then I would say, but what else do they love? And, and that was a kind of real point at which we, we sort of had to grapple with you know, the limitations of, of the platforms as they were now and start talking with Brandwatch about how they were going about solving those problems. So the, the key question was, um, you know, what do the people who love Clarks also talk about? So what are they talking about when they're not talking about Clarks? And I think that kind of gets to what we were trying to achieve. For me, as a researcher, a qualitative researcher, you ask that question all the time in your focus group. It's just, it, to me, it wasn't a big question. But technically, that's, as I now learn, quite a big question and something that hasn't necessarily happened before. So as you can see on the screen here, we were able to see what people were saying when they said they love Clarks, but really what we wanted to get to and what we did get to was discovering what else they love and other shoes they wear and what they do in their spare time so we could form the fuller picture of people just as you can in a focus group. I think that one of the things that we... One of the th about insights, I mean, I don't know how, where, your ga where you guys are at with analyzing data and looking for insights, but wh the way I, I do it, and I think it goes back, I can't remember when I got trained, it was in the 80s, so I think it was probably part of my introductory pack to market research, was understanding how to get to insight. And one of the best ways of doing that is to compare different groups because you can find the anomalies between, you can find the similarities between one group, say people who love Clarks, with people who hate Clarks, for example, and find out what are the key differences. And when you look at what the differences is and you ask a question, why would, why would the lovers love it so much and the haters dislike it, perhaps? You start to create hypothesis. And from the hypothesis, you can start to ask a, sep a different question which tests the hypothesis. So it's at several stages in your ev evolution of your query. And what we were doing, I think, was it allowing that allowing ourselves to create these different groups and then compare them and see what why they were different and also expand them so when you find a group of 109 people like we're talking about here who love clarks and then find out more about them then you can find all the people just like them right and you get to expand your understanding now one of our interesting debates was you know i was downloading you know like 200,000 people that said something about shoes or you know a million people in the whole world that said something about brogues or about heels but graham said no 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 just give me 100 people, 30 people. Give me a small focus group so that I can find out something of depth, you know. And, and, but I like the idea, and I like the idea, of then expanding that back out and finding all the people just like we found here, all the specific people that match such as the people on the screen here. I think that's, yeah, that's one of the things I would suggest from a qualitative approach to looking at this information. You've got an incredible amount of data to look at. And it's incredibly rich when you want to get into it. So the, the opportunity is there for you to go and find amazing things out. But I would say, don't be frightened of looking at small samples, small, beautifully formed quality, quality, samples of quality are just as valuable as huge samples of, 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 of variable quality. Now, one of the things that we talked about, as I said, we're doing focus group work inside of, I've got this slide here actually, I'll go back to it. Um, we're doing focus group work inside of social media and, and you said to me, no, we're not, Nathaniel. Can you say more about that? What, what, I don't quite. Well, remember one time I said to you, Graham, we're in here, I'm running a focus group. I, I'm actually running a focus group in mm. social data. You've walked through stores at Clark's. Mm. You've, you've actually met people, you've run focus groups. Yeah. What's the difference between me sitting there on my machine and looking at, you know, a million people talking about shoes, then a hundred people talking about shoes in Reading, and then five people talking about shoes in a little neighborhood in Reading. What's the difference between that and running a focus group in person? Because it's much more interactive. Unless you want to cross the Rubicon and start actually engaging. It was interesting watching the Harper guy talking about pulling out actual audiences and then reaching out to them. We didn't necessarily want to do that. That's a great opportunity. You can do that go for it, but we wanted to see how far we could go without actually crossing that, you know, making an actual one-to-one -one, uh, engagement. Um, so ultimately, 
with social media, if you're going to look at it in the way that we're talking about it here, it's a one-way conversation. They're just pumping information to you, and you've got to filter it. In a focus group, I can say to somebody, what did you mean about by that? You know, I can see somebody behaving in a certain way and ask them a question which will help me understand why, where they're coming from. It's hard to do that if you're, if you're not going to engage with them through social media. So it's not the same as a, a, a traditional focus group. I remember that one time we were sitting together and, and you, I think, said, hey, let's get the phone numbers. Let's call these people. Let's actually call them today or send them a survey monkey. Wouldn't that be kind of the same as sort of running a focus group to that call be, them up? That would be exactly the same, obviously. Okay. And, um, but we, like I say, we, th and that is open and available, and maybe that's, that's 3.0. So then I could actually sit on that beach in Koh Phangan in Thailand with my computer and do f run focus groups all over the world if I wanted to. Mm. I wouldn't have to be in London or in Reading mm. or in Bristol mm. walking into meeting people. And the incredible thing about social media is you can actually find extraordinarily appropriate people to talk to. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, when you're doing focus groups, you send out recruiters or you use a panel to find people. A lot of people in this room know all this stuff, but you, you can find people according to criteria that you set, uh, but you still don't quite know whether you're going to get the right people back in that room, in that focus group. Occasionally, they're completely wrong. Um, but I think with social media, there's so many people that you can look to, and even when it gets down to smaller numbers, you know that you're in the very you're in the right ballpark. You're in the right part of the ballpark to talk to those people. You have to obviously, I guess, make that introduction and, and make sure that they want to talk to you. But you know, there's a great opportunity to find exactly the right people, the great C respondents that are going to give you the information that you really need. To, a to answer specific questions. So I've got this theory that I'll be able to come into the new upcoming Brandwatch audience monitoring tool and search for women in the UK who like Adidas or who like Clarks and then push a button and see everything they say and then push another button and expand that audience to everybody just like them all over the world, which is kind of consistent with the slide that's up right now, where the machine sits next to me and I can do this within 10 minutes and the machine is doing it for me maybe a year from now, maybe maybe yeah. 15 months from now when the AI is really hot. Is that kind of a process, uh, will that eclipse traditional research or will we still do focus groups in person? I think you'll still do focus groups in person. Okay. But I think that this will, uh, this will be an, I think it will be much reduced because it's a pain in the ass going off and doing focus groups. It really is, it's a lot of work. And it's a lot of being in different places, exactly as you say. And a lot of it is you don't know which part of it is going to be valuable and which isn't. Um, and I think what you've got the opportunity to do with, through this methodology is to get to the people that you really want to talk to pretty quickly. Let's say that Clark... Uh, sorry, the, go ahead. The, and the AI part of it, I, can, you know, I completely buy into the fact that you can start very quickly create the algorithms that will get you to the right people and ask the right questions. Mm -hmm. There's still that kind of, it's not, it's not an equation, it's not a nice, neat sum. The answer isn't going to be a nice, it's not 47 or whatever the answer's going to be. You still will need to have that intuitive joining of the dots that's required from probably a human and all of the variables that they're dealing with to answer a particular brand's question, for example. So I think you're still going to need it, me. Um, but I, it, all of the hard work, all that stuff will, will be very quickly... Uh, taken care of. Let's say that Clark's extended the socializers contract from February 2016 for another year. And let's say you were joining me in doing that work. What oh. would we do? What do you want to do next with social media I like intelligence? The, uh, I like the Bali reference, actually. That'd be quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to run uh, the project in Bali yeah, why not? <laughs> with your family there and just do it, prove what, that we can do what it. Would okay. we, what would we do? I think that we would... Um, Look for depth. I mean, right now we're still, it's, we call this talk in the foothills of, of insight because we're really just starting on the journey and we don't actually know where it will end up. Uh, like you say, if you get AI involved, it gets, maybe it will get really interesting really quickly and I can't predict what that might be. Um, but I think that what we will look for increasingly is depth of 
the quality of the information, the understanding of what else is packaged up with that individual and why they're saying. It's all about context, which is, I think, some, a buzzword that has been going around. It's, it's great having all the data, but you really need to understand the context. And what this is about is building up that picture of who that person is, why they're doing, behaving this, the way they are. And I think that as what Brownwatch is doing is works towards gathering all that information around the data, um, we will get much richer insights into, you know, big issues. So you talked about panels. Like you, you in traditional focus group work, you do research and you discover specific groups of people and then you bring them together. They agree to be there. You run a focus group. Is it your opinion that brand watch and social media intelligence could be used to assemble those people in a more accurate way, in a faster way? Is this, is this tool something that could be used in discovering people for physical focus groups? Yes. Okay. An answer to that, yes. Okay. There is the Heisenberg principle, though, which is, you know, by looking at them, they change who they are. But that's what and I want. That's it. That's evolution. That's what I want to come yeah. back to you with, actually, from what you said mm. earlier. You said earlier something about interacting with people, mm. and I think there's real value in social intelligence in that they are saying something frankly and candidly, where they you weren't in the room with them. They talked about Clarks. They talked about Adidas. They talked about a shoe brand, and they didn't even know that someone was listening yes. to them. So isn't that? a little more valuable than what you get in a physical focus group? I, I'm just putting it out there. It's, is no, it? I, I think it's uh, wonderful to have, although it's not completely without um, uh, a kind of filter. They're mm. telling people, they're telling the world, they're not, tell, they're not necessarily bearing their souls. It has, they have an audience in mind, so that needs to be factored in. But there is a candid nature. I mean, when I do social media, I try not to couch it in too many kind of false or contrivances. I try to be me, and I think that a lot of people do. So that's a beautiful thing, and you can really see quality in you know, people's bios are beautiful things a lot of the time. Even when they, they try and hide little bits of it, you can still see who that person is, and you look at their photos, etc. There's loads and loads and loads of rich data. Yeah. Photo, photos are obviously one fantastic ways of getting a lot of data too. Um, you know, to, to the to the next question, yeah, it, you cross that Rubicon, you, you enter into a relationship, you will get slightly different answers. But that's also the case in a focus group. You know, a lot of focus groups, most of the focus groups we do these days are in facilities with two-way mirrors, and you have to explain there's a whole bunch of people through that looking in, watching you in the other room. That, that influences who the hell, what you're going to say. Um, so no, that none of these methodologies are perfect in any case. And there's a huge chunk of it is, is about you as, a, as, a, as the moderator or as the insight guy trying to peer in through all of the various uh, you know, factors that are influencing what is being said. So I th if, if it's okay with you, I think we'll involve some people from the audience a bit, if, if anybody wants to, and get some questions into the mix here to kind of go deeper with this. Is that all right with you? Okay. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions for us at this point? We, we did, actually. Yeah, so she asked, well, what exactly is it that you're testing? Like, what are you actually working on? So I actually took uh, traditional focus group questions, both open-ended questions and closed-ended questions, and then specific questions from within the business, within the brand. And then I reduced those to keywords. Because in the audience monitoring tool, which you'll all be using soon in Brandwatch, you're able to take keywords and actually see what a certain group is saying about those words. Like these 109 people, you can put in uh, what do these people say about wine, cider, beer, ale? Which they, which do they drink more? And you get to see it right away, you know, in a kind of a, a hierarchy. And so we had lots of questions. Some of them are um, sort of internal, and I can't tell you what they were. Uh, but basically, we're looking at, you know, wanting to get, as you can see in the next slide here, an identity around these people. So basic questions, right? Like where do you live? You know, what other shoe brands do you use? 
Um, how do you like those shoe brands? I'd also say it's, you can get a richness of, I mean, when you look at what else they're saying, you get, a hu even if there's 109 of them, you get a humongous amount of data come back about everything else that they talk about. So you can drill into how their lives are built and how they construct their world. For me, it's not then about asking another question about them, although you can look at their word clouds till the cows come home and find out lots of interesting things. It's comparing that group with a different group and seeing how they're different. And from that, creating the hypothesis. Why is that group saying that? And why is that group saying that? What is the thing that's different? And then maybe asking a different question uh, or looking, looking at, for example, let's say, we look at Clarks. We also want to see what pe lovers of Clarks also, what other brands do they love? So they might love Adi Adidas, for example. And then you look into, okay, let's look at everything they say about Adidas. Is there something qualitatively different about the way they talk about Adidas? Qualitatively different. Not, um, you're having to kind of use your own. Is the quality different to the way they're talking about Clarks? And something might come out of that. Then you... It might be about, I don't know, um, There's also different friendliness. Types. Yeah, that's good. Emotions. Clarks might be more friendly. That's right. Let's, yeah. let's look at how those people construct their world emotionally. Are they kind of approaching the life differently? So these are, these are and as I say, we're, this is the foothills. Um, but it suggests that we can go further before, even before you get to the kind of crossing the Rubicon and actually contacting them. You can go quite a long way in understanding how that community is different from a different community. And you start to, you know, when this thing comes through, at a click of a button, you will have an awful lot of that richness that you would just be speculating about previously. And I think there's some interesting stuff comes out of that. Does that answer your question? We did put emotions in too. Angry, sad, upset. Happy, glad, you know, joyful, because we wanted to see what kind of emotions are around different shoe brands, and that was an interesting thing too that we found out. Yeah. Yeah. If you're talking about personas as an actual social media accounts, qualitative research. Okay, so we we are not we're not at that stage yet. Uh, and I would kind of defer well, to you. He's not. I am. I can't <laughs> stop myself from creating. I, I'm, not, I'm not creating any for marketing purposes, yeah. though. I wanted to be clear about that, is that we're not creating fake personas for marketing purposes. Yeah. Yeah, qualitatively, yeah. I think you're talking about you can't help yourself. That's a, that's a shorthand of, of, of getting to the insights. And, but it's great for creating personas, isn't it? I mean, you, you've got all of the just the demographics, then you've got all of the qualitative stuff that they're talking about, all of the stuff they want you to think of you, th about them from their bios. So there's just a ton of information. I mean, it's brilliant for that, for creating these lovely kind of characteristic characters that represent a group. It's qualitative, guys. This is the kind of the interesting bit between what you, what a lot of people in the room do, which is all about the numbers, and what people perhaps like me and you do is about five people. It's a very different, and this is, I think, I just want to re-emphasize, it's been that meeting of the two worlds that's been interesting in our case, bringing the qualitative yeah. and the, I don't want to call it quantitative because it's not, it's, it's, it's more than just counting numbers, but the kind of thrill of seeing that much data um, is, is very intoxicating, but it's only great if you can get the quality out of it. We had a point where we broke down some people by filters and ended up with only 11 people. And, and, and I was like, oh, man, it's only 11 people. And Graham said, great, it's 11 people. That's a focus group. And I was like, oh, great, OK, we've got a focus group. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to say, say just a few reflection points. So I'm from Unilever. I'm the director who runs our social media there. The, I, I cannot tell you how strongly I agree with what you presented today. We find in Unilever that the, the, the ability to make, first of all, what, is, what previously been qualitative, actually quantitative because of the base size, is, is transformation. Um, we find that the, we are making enormous reductions in our qualitative spend because we're able to use tools like Brandwatch to give us qualitative insights. But we're also able to get new ideas that we wouldn't previously have had 
So quite often you're sitting in a focus group and somebody said something that's completely insane and you think to yourself, that's because that person is completely insane. <laughs> yeah. the, of course, what, what we're now able to do is because we can apply a quantitative lens onto their so-called insane idea, we sometimes find it's actually not so insane. So now we have ideas for new innovations, new products that are in full quantitative concept and use testing that came out purely from the kind of research that you're doing now. Um, so I just think this is completely the future. It's revolutionary stuff. It is, and it was interesting. When we first started working together, Graham said, my God, you are now going from seeing the people that talk about a topic to seeing everything else they're talking about. Why on earth, and this was a great question, and I'll put it to the room, why on earth didn't social media monitoring start with this in the first place? Why? Please why? tell me. Please tell me. <laughs> because because that is the I'm essence of research. I'm not a genius. It wasn't a difficult yeah. question. What, what, yeah. what is it? And yeah. you're all clever people. So what is, why well, is this? It, and so maybe it was the technology. Maybe it was, I don't know what. But that was, a, a, for me, as a social, intelligent, social media kind of marketing guy who's not a focus group person, I had an awakening then, which was sort of, you know, an amazing moment, which, which was, why didn't we do this seven years ago? And as Joel said, it's hard, yeah. Yeah, oh, that'd yeah. be why, right. that'd yeah. be why. It's actually yeah, it's quite difficult to do. It's narcissistic, isn't it? Because you want it, sorry. I think it's kind of narcissistic because you work for a brand, so you think, I want to know as much as I can about our brand and what they're saying about our products. And actually it takes an almost a next level of thinking to think, Actually, it's not just about us. It's about who they are, the other 99% of the time, just as you say. Um, and sorry to end it on my voice, but we do have another talk about to come up. Um, it's going to be Hoot Sweet next in this room, and it's going to be um, Michelle Uden from Bite London in the other room. So please, massive round of applause for these guys. Really enjoyed it. It was a great talk. We focused on focus groups and also on social data and how those two worlds come together. It's like social media intelligence versus a new world and the traditional world of uh, focus groups and qualitative research. It was quite an interesting pairing. We had Graham Hall with us. It was a very nice opportunity. In general, it was a wonderful energy. There were some excellent questions uh, and we were able to move forward in terms of some understandings that we had and get some feedback from people about that. We've been working in kind of a closed environment and now we're able to open it up to the world some more and get some feedback from real people. You know, the importance of having someone like Graham in the mix was that we were able to take somebody that has done hardcore qualitative research over a long time and inform our social media research in a different way. And I think for the future with audience monitoring, that's gonna be very important to have people like Graham involved to do that kind of rigor, to bring in that kind of rigor, that kind of um, specificity. Well, Nathaniel invited me to talk about the experience I've been having uh, working with him at Clark's Shoes and uh, we were talking at the Brandwatch conference. It was, it was a very exciting uh, conversation that we were having. We just stood up and really went through all of the experiences we, we've had together over the last two months, developing a new process for Clark's Shoes, looking at how to use social media monitoring. Um, it, it's been really interesting to bring these two schools of thought together. I mean, we're both very schooled in our own areas. Bringing them together was, um, it was iconoclastic in a way. I mean, it really was. I wasn't expecting that. But a lot of what social media monitoring does is, is exciting but inaccessible to somebody like me. So when I asked him if, could he deliver a different type of data cut up in a different way, it caused problems, but ultimately we found solutions and started getting very precise answers to questions that I wanted to answer. At the end of our talk, a guy from Unilever asked us you know, about what we were doing, but he also shared a story about what he's doing, and he said that what we're up to is the future of social media monitoring. That is fantastic to get that from someone in the heart of a very large brand. And I, and I thought that was an, a wonderful opportunity for us to hear that from him. Yeah, I think what, one of the things he was saying was he, goes, he watches a lot of focus groups. And what he was seeing was somebody might say something that's uh, unusual, and whereas previously you'd have thought, okay, that's a, that, that person is, is an anomaly. What you have a chance to do 
with social media monitoring and say, is that, is that really an anomaly or is there a lot of people out there who feel that way? So he could ladder up from a focus group, which is, I have not actually thought about that before. <laughs> it's actually very interesting. And one of the things that came up, obviously, in our work was, Graham said, how come you guys didn't do this from the start with social media monitoring? Why is it that from the start in social media monitoring, we weren't looking at everything that someone was saying or a group of people were saying? So this feels like a bit of a revolution in social media monitoring. We've come to a point with social media monitoring now where we are able to see everything that a group of people says. It's profound. Before, we could see what people said about a brand, about a topic, about something very specific. But now, we can see everything that that group says, that that specific group says. That is a very big point, a very big step in the history of social media monitoring, and it's a big honor to be a part of that.